Please silence your mobile devices. Our program is about to begin. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Good afternoon to all of you here in person and those tuning in online. I am Nadav Tamir, J Street Executive Director in Israel. Thank you. I am delighted to be here with you and hosting this afternoon's plenary session, Fighting for Democracy in Israel and Palestine. Over the next hour and a half, we will dive into the current challenges to democracy that both Israelis and Palestinians face today. We will explore the potential impacts of the most recent Israeli elections on the fabric of Israeli democracy. We will examine how the occupation presents one of the greatest ongoing threats to Israel's security and democratic foundations, as well as to Palestinian rights and hopes. And we will hear from Palestinians and Israelis that are working to address these threats to democracy and create a better future for their peoples. We will hear from Major General Yair Golan, a former Deputy Chief of Staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, and who up until most recently uh, was a member of the Knesset, the Merits Party, and the Deputy Minister of Economy, and we all hope that we, he will be back in the, scene, in the scene very soon. He continues to be a powerful voice of reason and morality, sharing a clear vision for what a secure Israel actually looks like. Following Major General Golan, we will hear virtual remarks from a few of J Street's friends in the Knesset that unfortunately could not be here in person with us today. We currently find ourselves in the final stages of the coalition building process. And this is one of the reasons why they can't be here, because they have to vote at a, cer at a certain point about this new government. I'm sure that this right-wing coalition will bring about significant challenges to Israel's democratic character, as well as the intercommunal relations in Israeli society, specifically those between Arab Palestinians and Jewish Israelis. The, the incoming coalition will also create challenges for Israel's foreign policy including relations with the United States and the policy towards the Palestinians. To dissect the current political moment and the potential impacts that the elections and incoming coalition may have on Israeli democracy and its policy in the occupied territories, we are privileged to be joined by political analyst and journalist Dr. Dalia Schneidling, uh, Esther Solomon, the editor of Haaretz in English, and Jacob Magid from Time of Israel, who will help us understand what would be in store for Israeli democracy and Palestinian rights. But first, I am pleased to now welcome Major General Yair Golan to the stage. Good afternoon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking J Street, the United States, and in Israel for arranging such an impressive conference. This is exactly the action that we must take to strengthen our ranks and fight for what is best for democracy, prosperity, security and peace for Israel and for the United States of America. With the most humble manner, I would say that I think I hold a unique point of view. The experience I got from commanding Judea and Samaria uh, from the Home Front Command and from coordinating the Iranian project as the Deputy Chief of Staff 
as well as my intensive period as a politician, brought me to a few conclusions I would like to share with you. Israel today faces three existential threats. The first is the Iranian threat. This is a unique threat, more severe than anything we have known since the Yom Kippur War, and essentially comprises of three sub-threats. The nuclear threat, the direct military threat from Iran's proxies in the Middle East, and the threat of regional Iranian hegemony and its effect on neighboring countries. Iran is a great challenge to Israel as it demands adapting the military and other security establishment dramatically. For example, conducting an ongoing campaign against Iran without breaching the threshold of war, investing in new weapons, training forces by new methods, building ability to fight on land as well as long range, developing the best active defense system in the world. Coupled with high level civil defense capabilities and other formidable changes we had to implement. All these are just glimpses to the challenge. I support diplomatic courses of action against Iran if it's possible, and I think it was a grave mistake the previous administration made to pull out of the JCPOA. You know, it's not written here, but I can assure you, a few days after the agreement was signed, we gathered together all prominent figures in the Israeli security establishment, and we were all agree that the, the agreement was good for Israel. A, prof a professional stand, not a political stand. Unfortunately, you know the rest. Of course, meeting the Iranian threat mandates a strong alliance between Israel and America, regional and international cooperation, long-term resources allocation, and maybe the most important factor, a strong Israeli security with national resilience, social stamina, and solidarity. Israel's solidarity is under a grave threat I will sell more on that matter soon. The second threat is the Palestinian one. I consider it more severe than the Iranian threat because of its presumable weakness. The Palestinian issue threatens to tear up Israeli society from within. Implemented, sorry. There is no more controversial issue than the future of the territories. No other issue has caused so much political violence in Israel, and no issue requires reaching decisions tough as those required by the Palestinian issue. In fact, Israel has two options, one destructive and the second very difficult. Israel must choose, the sooner the better, between annexation and separation. Remember that, annexation or separation, these are the only two options looking ahead to the future. Annexation will destroy the Zionist dream. Between 2.6 to 3.2 million Palestinians live in Judea and Samaria. 2.1 million Palestinians live in the Gaza Strip. The Messianic right in Israel aims to annex Judea and Samaria, reoccupy Gaza, and rebuild Gush Katif. It's crazy. This Messianic vision 
is a complete madness. Israel's only chance is to choose the options of separation. I will not explain now, but separation can be implemented, can be implemented practically. I'd be more than glad to elaborate about that later. The fulfillment of the Zionist vision is a homeland for the Jewish people with a solid Jewish majority, and we need to admit that. This is the only route to a free, equal, and democratic state. All other attempts to force together two different populations, roughly the same size, with a long history of animosity and war, is destined to fail. The challenge of creating a true and equal partnership with a large Arab minority, the Arab citizens of Israel, is challenging and difficult enough. Separation won't be easy to carry out either, but it is the only chance for a future of security and peace for Israel. The process of ex executing the separation may have to involve unilateral, bilateral, and multilateral actions, and Israel, as a regional power, must take initiative and lead the course. It's all about, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's all about initiative. And I shame, I am shamed to say that we lost this, this ability to take initiative. The third threat to Israel's future is the combined trend of corruption, messianic and violent nationalism with, all, with ongoing attacks on the, on the judicial branch and the rule of law. A process of combining complete politicization of the national institutions, further erosions of the freedom of press and media, and increasing polarization among all countries' different groups. The expected government, the presumed coalition, and the campaign promises of the upcoming ministers do not bode well. I fear, so long as Netanyahu's trial continues, the devastation shall as well. The rift between entire populations shall only intensify, and this is the greatest existential threat to Israel's future. Democracies can collapse into themselves. There are several such examples in the world, but Israel, facing external threats, cannot allow itself such inner havoc that will translate into national, diplomatic, and military weakness. You must be asking yourselves, what can be done? Much work is needed in the public and political sphere, sphere and much in the political and partisan arena. I intend to be active in both. The results of the recent elections did not weaken me. My earlier predictions turned out to be true. I am more than obliged to continue to share with you my thoughts on the, on the possible causes of action, and I have no intention to give up. <laughs> All we need are very simple matters. Clear vision, good planning, strong leadership, and the great determination are needed. Israel is the homeland of all Jewish people, as a devoted servant of Israel and a true Israel patriot, I ask you to continue to take all action possible. We in Israel need your wisdom, your insight, your unique Jewish culture, your organizational capabilities, your political knowledge, and all other means you may commit and share. I thank you for all the incredible work you have done already. In two weeks, we shall celebrate Hanukkah, the holiday that symbolizes the freedom of Israel. 
but for a short period of time. A freedom that was extinguished by short-sighted leaders whose corruption and lack of understanding of the local and regional powers brought upon us terrible defeats. It is my hope and wish that we shall learn from our own history and we leave out the blessing. Adonai oz le'amo iten, Adonai yevarech et amo bashalom. May the Lord grant strength to his people. May the Lord bestow on his people peace. It won't be done without our own deeds. Thank you very much. God bless you. Dear friends, I would so love to be with you in Washington with a J Street community of Israelis and Americans who believe in a just and fair Israel in two states for two peoples, in an end to the conflict and in peace and security for Israelis and for Palestinians. That vision has become much harder to achieve because of the deeply distressing results of last month's elections. Even though the popular vote was a tie, we failed to prevent Netanyahu's return to power. God knows Labour did its best during the last coalition and government to keep him away from government, but this time, unfortunately, we did not succeed. It requires us to look deeply and to work to do better. I promise you that. I and we are completely doing this. For Israelis and our friends around the world, the inclusion of the far right in the new government is a frightening and a shocking prospect. It will be felt, too, in our relationship with the American Jewish community. We will continue to fight for our values, democracy, equality, and the rule of law from the opposition. We will speak up for the independence of the judiciary and for equality before the law. We will continue to promote an Israel where all Israelis are treated equally, Jewish and Arab and all others. We will oppose any assault on the rights of women and the LGBTQ plus community. We will wage it knowing that the vast majority of Israelis did not vote for the Kahanists and the racist and homophobic allies. We will oppose them knowing that we in Israel are not alone in dealing with far-right parties in government, and I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. My message to you, our partners in the United States, is stand with us, stand by us. Promote the values you hold dear for democracy and human and civil rights. Israeli progressives and the wider Israeli public need you, need you and your support and solidarity as we seek to protect the soul of the Israeli nation from a pernicious ideology. As we have fought in the past for what we believe in, we will do so again and again, as much as we need to. Labor will always make the case for two states. Without a two-state solution, we will become one state for two nations. That will be the end of the state of Israel as we know it and love it. And we will not let that happen. And so we reject the notion of managing the conflict. We will continue to advocate and to fight for a political process to find a peaceful solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We oppose all those who bring terror to the streets of Israel and incite and glorify violence. These are not easy times for progressives in Israel. But what defines us as progressives is not simply our belief in solidarity and internationalism, but our optimism about the future. Even as we face the challenge of rebuilding our party and our political camp, I have confidence that the values which make Israel so special, the ones that you admire so much, will endure. 
Thank you and have a great convention. Thank you and welcome. I'm gonna start by framing our conversation briefly about fighting for democracy in Israel and Palestine. How did we get here? And let me explain what I mean by that. I think we all agree that Israel is having a democratic crisis and I think we need to diagnose it correctly. Are we having this crisis because alien forces of extremism have suddenly sprung up within Israel? maybe cynically manufactured by politicians? Or are there deep, long-term roots that we need to confront? Why are we talking about democracy in Israel and Palestine as if it's all our responsibility? This seems to be something of an acknowledgement that at present, for the moment, there's only one state that currently holds meaningful political, military, economic, and diplomatic power in the region. It's becoming increasingly hard to maintain the image of temporariness to the occupation. And that's why we need to ask how Israeli politics, society, and policy affects all people of the region, or the reverse. How does the fact of ongoing conflict and occupation color and influence and maybe even control Israeli society and politics? Let me put out a final framing question. Is there any separation, really, between the profoundly undemocratic nature of permanent occupation and what we often think of as Israel's domestic issues, particularly these theocratic elements we're seeing trying to dominate Israeli policy and education, family law, sexuality, but also the abiding attacks on Israel's democratic institutions, particularly the judicial branch. These are long and complicated questions. Luckily, I don't have to answer them. Uh, for that, I'm gonna to turn to my panelists and I'm delighted to have them. Uh, honored, actually, to be moderating this conversation. I'll introduce them. Um, Esther Solomon is the editor-in-chief of Haaretz English. She moved to Israel in 1998, originally from London, where she studied English literature at Cambridge International Relations at LSE. She ran the opinion section at Haaretz, which she helped to establish for 16 years before becoming editor-in-chief. She also writes herself on wide-ranging issues. Read her stuff, I recommend it, everything that she writes. Uh, she's a founder of Kihilat Yacha, the progressive modern orthodox community in Tel Aviv. Jacob Magid is the US correspondent of the Times of Israel. Uh, he covers developments in the US relating to Israel, the Middle East, and the Jewish world. Prior to that, he covered everything you ever wanted to know about settlements uh, as the Times of Israel's West Bank correspondent. Now, we have a very brief session, so we're gonna be efficient. I am going to do three rounds of one question for both panelists. Each one will answer, and then we'll wrap. Okay. So let me start with you, Esther. And this again, this is the same question to both panelists, and we'll try to do three rounds in here. After the 2022 elections and the political forces that were unleashed, do you see this as a major rupture from Israel's political trajectory, or do you see any aspect that is deep levels of continuity? I think to take the, the most uh, important aspect first, it definitely is a deep rupture and it is a watershed that we all have to recognize as such. There's absolutely no point sugarcoating what has happened. Israel now has its most right-wing, racist and theocratic government ever. Um, I think that Haaretz columnist uh, Yossi Verta put it quite well when he said, the incomprehensible is fact, the hallucination is reality. That in some ways describes uh, not only what has happened, but also the state of shock of many uh, in Israel, in the center and the left, about the prospect of a government that really is the most extremist in Israel's history. If we just go back in 1984, which was the last time that Mayor Kahana, who was you know, the father of uh, this Jewish variant of fascism, was allowed to stand for the Knesset, he won 26,000 votes. This year, religious Zionism, which is the name of the party that continues, at least part of it continues his legacy, they won more than half a million votes. So that is to say more than 10% of Israelis voted uh, for this particular party, and half of all Israelis voted for a bloc that was happy to sit with this party. There is not really much way to say that uh, this is anything other than uh, a rupture in uh, Israel's history. This is the first time most of the government 
uh, the sitting uh, members of the government, the MKs, are orthodox or ultra-orthodox. That's also a first. Uh, just a year and a half ago, for the Bennett government when it was sworn in, it, won, uh, it appointed a record nine women to the cabinet. That was also a record number of women in cabinet positions. Now in this government, there are nine women in the 64-member coalition uh, that will be in power. Nine women MKs. Forget about cabinet ministries. We're talking about net, just net the number of women in a 64-member block. There are nine of them. So, so in all of those ways, it clearly is a, a big difference. But we can't avoid the fact that it is building on trends that have been going on for a while. You know, Israel's been moving rightwards. The left block has somewhat collapsed. The young vote is definitely moving quite a lot more rightwise. Uh, and many people would say that, you know, one of the threads is that the occupation has normalized the level of violence and abuse of human rights uh, that is now seeping into uh, Israeli discourse uh, in general. Thank you. Perfectly on time. Three minutes. Two of them. <laughs> All right. So I'll try to be a little bit more optimistic, but not really. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if you were here and if there was, a, there was a conference in 2015, but I'm pretty sure some of the reactions to the election in Israel in that year might have been kind of sounded what, to what we're hearing now, which is the end of the world. And we're close. We are very close. But um, that was at the point where Netanyahu had also won a majority. Uh, the right wing had a, a, almost a homogenous government in a lot of ways. Um, and yet... What we saw in the next uh, seven, eight years is no formal annexation. Uh, there hasn't been a radical change on the ground with how Palestinians are treated. On the other hand, there was, we did see the nation law passed, the nation state law passed that kind of elevated or enshrined Israel's Jewish character above its democratic character. And I think that's created a lot of tailwind to some of the moves that we've seen since. Now, the unity government that we had over the past about roughly a year managed to, I think, roll back some of those trends. And we saw restarting meetings between senior Israeli and Palestinian officials, thousands of work permits that were approved for, for Palestinians to come work in, in Israel and the settlements, uh, the legalization of thousands of their status in the West Bank. Um, de facto, though, I think we still continue to see a lot of the the steps in the West Bank that the Biden administration has worked to stop. On the other hand, they have what we, in 2011, we talked about there was a freeze in settlements for 11 months that the Obama administration worked tirelessly to institute um, and, and exhaust a lot of political capital. The Biden administration has actually managed over the past year, almost a year and a half, to quietly institute something similar where there's been no meetings of the planning committee to advance settlements. So those are the kinds of things that have happened over the past year. Um, on the other hand, though, I would caution this point out, there hasn't really been the shrinking of the conflict that the Biden administration or the Prime Ministers Netanyahu and Lapid talked about. Um, and there's not been a Palestinian Prime Minister who's been willing to meet with, uh, sorry, an Israeli Prime Minister who's been willing to meet with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. And no real follow-up on a few of those, the plans that the US has announced. But there has, um, so I wouldn't maybe, I don't know if I would go far as to say this is a rupture. I think it's more of a return to what we saw pre this government and an acceleration in some of those trends um, that we saw before the unity government came into power. And those trends related to the putting the kind of the enshrining the Jewish character, but what Orthodox Jews review, view as the Jewish character above the democratic character. Um, and that will, and I think what we can expect moving forward is that acceleration of those trends. Gone are the days where Defense Minister Gantz or whoever it will be that replaces him hosts the pa Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Gone are the days of um, strengthening the PA. And also, I think killings of Palestinian protesters will likely go up because now we have in government in Israel people who are kind of cheerleading uh, soldiers who are uh, misbehaving or uh, assaulting or, or um, mistreating activists and, and, and Palestinians. Okay. okay. So first of all, apologies to my panelists for pressuring you, but we're trying to get through lots of material here. Um, I want to ask a second question. As we see the government sh taking shape, that we think is taking shape, uh, the ideas, the people, the policies, the parties involved, and the people they represent, how do you see these things manifesting in policy, law, or changes in Israeli life? And again, try to keep this to two and a half minutes. Let's see, yeah, so we can okay. have time for the last question. All right. Um, so the 
the agreement that uh, the Likud Netanyahu's party made with Otsma Yehudit, the, the far right uh, Kahana is party um, gives uh, Itamar Ben Gvir authority over border police in the in the West Bank, which regularly interacts with West, uh, settlers and with Palestinians. He'll have broader control over the entire police force as a national security minister, and this is a force that is heavily involved in conduct on the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Al -Aqsa Mosque compound. And this is someone who's pushed for eroding or changing the status quo in that, in that, in that area where Jews are currently not allowed to pray. And this is something that he's tried to, he's campaigned against. Um, will he announce, I think, tomorrow or whenever he's uh, in that, uh, instituting the government, a new, a new status quo on the Temple Mount? I don't think so. I think Netanyahu will, will really prevent that to, uh, to ha from happening because I think he really cares about maintaining the Abraham Accords um, that he's managed to bring forward a couple of years ago. Uh, but I do think we'll see, and it continued like we were going to see in the West Bank, with this erosion of the status quo there, I think we'll see it also in terms of the status quo on the Temple Mount, um, more turning a blind eye to Jewish prayer, uh, more active police presence there, and those are kinds of things that really can spark conflict, not just in Jerusalem, but as we've seen in the May 2021 Gaza War, in, the, in West Bank, in Gaza, and um, in, even in, mixed, in the so-called mixed cities in Israel. Um, I think Palestinian protesters will likely meet uh, more lethal force with uh, Itamar ben is talking about changing the rules of, of, rules of engagement for when the uh, soldiers can open fire. Do I think that there'll be an official change in those rules? I don't think so. It's still the IDF that kinds of, kinds of controls those, those issues. But I do think when you have, again, lawmakers who are more willing to defend uh, misaction or inaction or inappropriate action by Pal Israeli soldiers, those kinds of things are likely to go up. In the defense ministry, um, we'll have uh, the, the religious Zionism party led by Bezal Smotrich uh, will be in charge of the civil administration and COGAT, which are two bodies that are in, responsible for settlement approvals, for Palestinian home demolitions, for outpost legalizations, for uh, authorizing Palestinian building permits. So just uh, predict which uh, trend you think those issues will go in, and that's uh, where we'll be heading, I think, under this government. Again, maybe no formal annexation, but I think de facto is what we'll likely be seeing. Um, I'll cut it for now. Thank you. Feel free to ask me about what the Biden administration will do afterwards. <laughs> Well, I think the, the, one of the most significant uh, changes and probably one of the first that we will see is this assault on the, uh, the Supreme Court, which is uh, sometimes called the judicial override uh, uh, law that uh, pretty much everyone in the new coalition uh, is willing and bound uh, to pass that will prevent uh, the Supreme Court from adjudicating about laws uh, in the Knesset, or rather there won't be a, a possibility of appealing to the Supreme Court if the Knesset passes rules that are considered uh, to be unconstitutional in, in the, the broad sense that uh, Israel has in terms of its basic laws in the absence of a natural constitution. And that has you know, enormous potential effects for uh, the rule of law uh, in Israel and has already created uh, significant concern within Israel and abroad. Uh, but the tentacles of, uh, of the potential uh, effect of the inclusion of the far right in the government go into almost every uh, aspect of uh, civ civil society life in Israel, from the educational system, where they're more likely than not to limit the kinds of uh, content of, of secular schools which so far have uh, avoided being uh, um, influenced by um, religious and, and super nationalistic content that's creating a huge amount of, uh, of fear in Israel at the moment. There's going to be some kind of attack on the LGBTQ plus community of some kind. You know, the minister in charge of uh, Jewish identity is also from the far right and he has called them the gay community deviants in the past so there's not that much uh, we can expect. Uh, there will be uh, likely some kind of uh, attempted uh, uh, attack on um, uh, conversion and the law of return and who is uh, who can make Aliyah which will have all sorts of impacts on uh, refugees, for instance, from the Ukraine who may or may not be allowed in, and obviously more widely in terms of how diaspora Jews relate to Israel as a country that 
could and would accept them as Jews. Thank you. I'd like to try to ask one last question, and this is going to be the most important of all in some ways. Uh, you know, the winners of this election are not the final word. Uh, the number of people who voted for the parties supporting Netanyahu's supporting bloc versus the number of people who voted for the parties that opposed going into a coalition with Netanyahu were almost evenly divided. Very small majority, but very small for, uh, for the Netanyahu bloc. That's about half the voters. Okay, who, did, who voted in opposition to Netanyahu, that's a lot of people. What unifies them? Is, can we identify a unifying theme? I mean, commentators have begun, begun to call this the democratic camp on some level, partly because of what Esther mentioned, the attacks on the judiciary that have come to characterize the far right. Do you see old themes, new themes, emerging themes, which are likely to be failures, which are likely to be mobilizing and successful in the future, in your opinion? And for this, I'll start with Esther again, and then go back to Jacob, and then we'll wrap up. Well, yes, the truth is that roughly 50% of Israelis didn't vote for the, gov for the government that is in formation. So in effect, that is a 50% of the population that you have to build some kind of, um, you know, in the words of, you know, 2016 in America, some kind of resistance movement. The problem is that uh, it is a very uh, fragmented, uh, it's not really one camp, it's fragmented firstly between Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis. Uh, there are certainly efforts to try and bring um, uh, Jewish and Arab uh, Israelis together into one kind of camp that is uh, more fundamentally uh, uh, acknowledging uh, each other's uh, needs than, than the political uh, configurations that have been before. The question is really if that is more likely to succeed, all the kinds of issues that will affect people in their everyday lives, that is when their children come back from school and tell, tell their parents what they've been taught that day. You know, it's about people with um, uh, friends and children and colleagues who are from minority communities who experience discrimination on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that these are probably the, the issue. If there is more segregation of women in the public sphere, I think that, to be honest, uh, these are the kinds of issues that are more likely to get people out on the streets. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd agree. There's little that unites this coalition, and what it, or the, now it's in the opposition. That was all it was just Netanyahu, that they didn't want Netanyahu to return to power. So trying to find some sort of issue is definitely challenging, and I think. I'm not going to pretend like I know for sure the answer, but I do think that we have seen coalitions being tried to be built around this idea of democracy, of preventing the erosion of the justice system, of opposing religious coercion. We have seen those things. Um, but I think um, even from the left, when there's, a, there's an attempt to kind of try to stress this idea that we've just heard about, about um, separating from the Palestinians, which does have some, carry some um, acceptance among a lot of Israelis, but I think it also alienates um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I think it's a numbers game, right? Um, it's possible that the center left doesn't really have the majority there to kind of put together a coalition of that kind of nature. Um, but again, trying to win some sort of majority while ignoring 20% of the population, which is Palestinian citizens of Israel, is kind of like trying to fight, a, uh, make a fight without, with a hand tied behind your back. And there, I would, when we talk about genuine Arab-Israeli partnership, or Arab, sorry, Arab-Jewish partnership in Israel, um, it can't go, it can't just be a cliche. It has to extend beyond um, quietly cooperating behind closed doors. There has to be a willingness amongst Israeli politicians to actually and publicly talk about and be proud of the Arab-Israeli, Arab-Jewish cooperation, sorry, um, and not be condemning every Palestinian lawmaker every time they say anything related to the Palestinian cause. And there has to be an ability to, to understand where they're coming from. And I think until you do that, and until you actually are willing to build a coalition that at least sees commonality on, those, on, on these kinds of issues, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to unite. I think the last thing I'll say is that there's this assumption that uh, there's nothing in common between the, the Jewish resident of Tel Aviv and, and a Palestinian resident of Nazareth. But I don't know how much there is really in common, or less there is in common with, with a Likud voter from Sterot and a, ultra, a United Torah Judaism ultra-Orthodox party from Bnei Brak. Um, but yet, Netanyahu has managed to get those two kinds of populations to work almost um, seamlessly in a block that has controlled the Israeli political game for quite some time, even with this one-year break. 
And, and I think and until we see uh, Arab and, and Jewish lawmakers working together in that kind of seamlessness, I don't think we'll see a sort of majority that we're talking about. Thank you to the panelists for working with me on long, hard, very many, you know, lots of material and very little time. I will take moderator's prerogative, even though we've almost run out the clock, and try to summarize a few points about democracy. What worries me the most is the attempt in Israel to redefine what democracy is. So let's just review briefly what it's not. Democracy is not just majority rule. It is not just one branch of government. It is not just elections. An electoral democracy is a stripped down democracy missing a lot of pieces. Democracy is not just governance. It's civil society, it's active engagement of citizens, and it's values and norms. And you can't have a democracy where some are equal. Democracy is based on self-determination and equality for all. Thank you. Hello, J Street. Shalom lekulam. On the 29th of November, 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. This right is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign state. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based in, on freedom, justice, and peace, as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure completely equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their people in an offer of peace and good neighbor lines, and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people settled in its own land. The State of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common of effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. This is an excerpt from the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, and these are the principles to which I am committed, together with my colleagues from the Hamachanea Hamamlachti, party led by Benny Gantz. We will continue to be a governing alternative and fight as the opposition in all governments' efforts to harm Israeli democracy, alienate non-Orthodox, and harm conversion processes. We strive for peace and at least long-term arrangement with the Palestinians. I want to assure you that we will continue to be a voice of reason in the political arena. We will preserve the Jewish and democratic identity of the State of Israel using all the means of our disposal. We are committed to it. I wish us, I wish us all better days and that we may continue to strengthen our friendship based on democratic, liberal, and humanistic values. Thank you, J Street, for supporting my work for peace and democracy. Thank you very much. Hey, J Street, and thank you for this opportunity. As our allies in the U.S., you know that these are tough times for the Israeli democracy, with horrific threats to equality and our justice system that stands for minorities. I'm a proud left, Zionist, progressive, social democrat, pro-peace woman. And in this crucial time, I know it is our mission to rebuild our community and most importantly, our future generation who we cannot afford to lose for the ones who sell them nothing but hate. I will do everything in my power to build a coalition of political parties, labor unions, local and national leadership 
civil society organizations, and discriminated groups such as LGBTQ, ethnic minorities, minimum wage workers, and social housing residents. We need to work together toward our next challenges. Instead of mourning, we will organize and fight against bigotry, nationalism, and extremists for democracy, justice, and yes, peace. There's an Hebrew song with the line, everybody talks about peace, but nobody talks about justice. Nowadays, it feels like nobody talks about peace and nobody talks about justice. Peace is possible, justice is doable, we don't have the privilege to give up hope. I would like to send a warm thank you to J Street for all their magnificent support for a better Israel. We need you now, today, more than ever. Thank you, and may you have a successful and meaningful conference. I am so proud to have allies like Merav, Naama, and Dalon still in the Knesset, representing a clear voice for democracy, peace, and justice, and I hope that soon Yair will also be in leadership position. Ultimately, we strongly believe that these critical values can only be sustained and guaranteed by ending the occupation. As we heard from Major General Golan and from Dr. Schneidlin, the occupation is a clear impediment to Israel's security and democracy. And of course, the reality of occupation directly impacts the lives of Palestinians every day. By the way, it's not only General Golan, it's most of the IDF uh, officers who are not in uniform saying the same, but we need to hear it from politicians as well. Access to basic human needs and rights are regularly compromised or denied. The occupation not only impacts Palestinians living throughout the West Bank and Gaza, but also those living throughout the diaspora. To gain a glimpse into how the occupation affects the daily lives of Palestinians, we will hear now from our friend Nasser Nawaja, a Palestinian resident of Susia, a village in the South Hebron Hills, located in Area C of the West Bank, an area that comprises of 60% of the West Bank and is under full Israeli control. Every, please. מים, yeah. לכולם מגיע מים. לא משנה חוקים, לא משנה אתה מוצלם, נוצרי, יהודי, לא משנה הצבע שלך, לבן, שחור, חום, מי אתה, לא משנה. זה בסיסי מים לכל בן אדם. אבל הזכות הזה לא מגיעה לפלסטינים, לא מגיעה לתושבי סוסיה. אמא שלי נולדתי ב-82 בסוסיה, 86 נגרשנו משם, הגענו לאדמה חקלאות ליד הכפר שלנו, איפה יושבים היום. התנחלות סוסיה בכיוון המזרח נבנתה 1982 על אדמה שלנו, והכפר נגרשנו ממנו, סוסיה הפכו אותו אתר ארכיאולוגי, ואנחנו נמצאים בין שני התנחלויות אלה. וסופלים אלימות מתנחלים, השתלטות על אדמה שלנו. יש שני סוגים של בורות מים באזור הזה, לפי הגודל. בור משפחתי, 80 קוב ליד הבית, בור לשקיעת הצאן, חקלאות. זה 200 קוב, זה בשדות, בהרים, במרעה, נמצאים שם, קרובים להתנחלויות. למשל, סוסיה, יש, יש 28 בור מים מסביב של סוסיה. מהתחלת אינתיפאדה ב-2001, כאילו, יתחילו מצב ביטחוני אחר פה בכל האזור. איפה התנחלויות? מסביב אסור לפלסטיני להתקרב, למרות זה הבורות, הבורות, של, הבורות שלהם, אדמה חקלאות שלהם. איפה צבא? אסור לפלסטינים להתקרב. 
80% מהמקור מים שלנו, לא יכולים להגיע לשם בגלל הצבא, בגלל המתנחלים. מול העיניים שלנו, בור מים שלנו, מתנחלים בשבת מגיעים, שוחים שם ואנחנו צמאים בלי מים. אנחנו לא יכולים להגיע לקחת מים לילדים שלנו ולחיות שלנו. נשארו הבור, הבורות הקטונות של מ-80 ל-120 קוב, וזה אם אתה משתמש כיד צאן, משפחה, הכל, מקור אחד, מבור אחד הקטן, זה בחודש שש נגמר. המינהל אומר, אוקיי, תעשו תיאום. הצבא ישמור עליכם ותיקחו מים. אומרים, בסדר. דרך עורכי הדין, עושים תיאום. לא לכל פלסטיני בוט, יש לו טרקטור ומחליף מים וזה. יש כאלה משפחות, לוקחים אזכרה מיאטה. אנחנו מוכנים בבוקר מוקדם, ליד הכביש, בנקודת המפקד שלנו מהצבא. הצבא הרבה פעמים אומר, דוחים. הרבה תירוצים להם עושים בשביל לא להגיע. אבל לפעמים זה עובד. מגיע ג'יפ של הצבא, כל הטרקטורים נוסעים אחרי הג'יפ. בשביל להיכנס לאזור של בורות מים. מגיעים לבור מים, מפעילים משאפה בנזין, המשאפת בנזין עושה רעש. מי אחוז מהבעמים המתנחלים מתערבים. מגיעים מתנחלים, אפילו מגיעים שניים, לא יותר, עולים על בטח של בור מים. הצבא אומר, לא, אני לא רוצה סכסוך. כשאתה צבאי, שניכם הולכים הביתה. אבל בשביל מה התיאום? למה תיאמנו? למה דרשתם מאיתנו לתאם? בשביל לשמור עלינו, בשביל אם מגיעים מתנחלים. לסלק איתם ולתת לנו לקחת מים. אומרים, לא, 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 שני צדים הולכים הביתה. יש הבדל בין שני הצדים. צד של המתנחלים הולכים לבית, וכל זווית במטפח, בשירותים, יש לו ברס, פותח, יש לו מים. פלסטיני הולך לכבס מים. להביא מים עד סוסיא, יוצא לנו 35 שקל קוב מים. למתנחלים, יוצא פחות משבע שקל. למה פחות משבע שקל? בגלל הם מחברים לקו המים הזה. עובר באדמה פרטית שלנו. הגשנו בקשה מסודרת. לוועדת מים במינהל אזרחי, להתחבר במים הזה, ל- לקו הזה. הם אמרו, את מכפר לא חוקי, אנחנו לא מחברים אתכם. הרבה מאחזים, לפי חוק ישראלי, הם לא חוקים, אבל מחברים למים וחשמן ודרך אספלט והכול. בסוף זה לא עניין חוקי ולא חוקי. נלחמים איתנו בצרכים בצר... הכי בסיסיים שלנו פה, הריסת פיתים, מים, חשמן, כבישים. וכל הצרכים האלה בשביל לגרש איתנו מבוא, לפטר מעצמנו וללכת למקום אחר. אנחנו בסוסיה חיפשנו הצדק בבית משפט עליון מעל 20 שנה. לא מצאנו צדק. הדבר היחיד שומר על סוסיה ועל קהילות במספר יטא מגירוש, מצווי הריסה, על החס הבינלאומי. אנחנו קוראים לקהילה הבינלאומית לעזור לנו בשביל להישאר באדמתנו, למנוע את הגירוש והריסת הביתים שלנו. Every time I hear Nasso speak, I am moved by his perseverance and strength in the face of such injustice. J Street Education Fund has taken many members of Congress and their staff to visit Nasser and other Palestinian communities in Area C, and I have to tell you that whenever I'm, we're there, I have tears in my eyes. As a result of those visits, members have spoken out against home demolitions and evictions, and in support 
sorry. And in support and involvement of Americans like you do to help that. I just lost my... Um, Oh, here it is. Uh, I am proud to stand alongside Palestinians throughout the West Bank and Gaza as they continue to fight for the realization of their rights and democratic freedoms. At J Street, we believe that Palestinians have the same right to self-determination as the Jewish people do. While we know that the ongoing occupation prevents the establishment of a viable, thriving, democratic Palestinian state, we also know that the Palestinian Authority's governance in the West Bank and Hamas governance in Gaza are from, far from representative of democracy. Responsibility for advancing democracy in Palestine also rests on the shoulders of Palestinian leaders. For Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, the reality of the occupation is compounded by the absence of democracy. The reality of being stateless has ripple effects for Palestinians around the world. To shed some light on this reality, we are lucky to now have the opportunity to hear from Majd Mashrawi, the CEO and founder of Sandbox, and a prominent social activist for Gaza. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Majd Mashrawi. As a Muslim, a woman, a mother, an engineer, and a social entrepreneur from Palestine, Gaza, I have an interest, I have a vested interest in the plight of my people, of the Palestinians. For those who don't know, Gaza is 25 miles long and about 15 miles wide, and it's considered as the largest open-air prison in the world. So just imagine how many young people in Gaza are not afforded the opportunity to leave, not just because of COVID, but because of a 16-year-old blockade imposed in Gaza. Two million people in Gaza are completely isolated from the world. Gaza is my home, and it's the home for those two million people who are young, ambitious, and creative. Limitations in Gaza are real. People just give up trying. Limitations include borders, lack of electricity, sometimes to six hours, to less than six hours a day, no freedom, 60% unemployment ratio among young people like me, 96% of, of our water is polluted. And most of all, we have no freedom. I was resolved to help my community and bring an internal freedom to explore ideas, understand the world, and escape virtually from this prison. Therefore, I launched two successful social companies, Green Cake and Sandbox. In 2014, more than 15,000 houses were destroyed during the war, including my family home. 170,000 people lost their houses and they became homeless. Politics and the war put more restrictions on importing building materials into Gaza. In that time, the idea of my first business, Green Cake, was born. I invented a patentable building block made out of ashes and rubble of the demolished houses in Gaza to rebuild what the war has destroyed. <laughs> After a green cake, I found out that we need energy to run <laughs> to produce these blocks. Then, in 2017, I launched my second company, Sandbox which is a social enterprise that provides affordable solar systems for the unprivileged communities in the Middle East, starting with the Palestinian market, Gaza specifically. Up to date, with Sandbox and Green Cake, we have built 
hundreds of homes for the families who lost their houses. We also provided solar systems to over 75,000 people in Gaza. We also provided 35,000 people with free clean water from desalination plants that are powered by our solar systems. <laughs> this is a photo I took by my phone. We also provided over 120 handicapped children who became handicapped as a result of the wars in Gaza with solar systems to run their medical devices, including nebulizers and electrical mattresses. I remember watching a woman in near, next to our neighborhood holding her kid to the nearest mosque to run his nebulizers three times a day. That's not a life. With Sunbox, we were able to change the life of more than 100,000 capital in Gaza Strip. <laughs> I've had the privilege to give a TED talk and attending conferences around the world. However, I'm not here today not just to talk about my accomplishments in Gaza. I'm here to talk about something different that I can, I can nowhere else talk about. I wanted to talk about how living in a cage and being free feels like. I wanted to share with you how it feels to live without a state, to be stateless how to be treated and equally everywhere you go just because of who you are, just because of your identity, just because of being a Palestinian. When I'm invited to fellowships and conferences and programs across the world, I accept invitations, not just because I wanted to see the rest of the world, no, because I, I hold a story on my shoulders that I feel I need to deliver to the people around the world who has no idea about how life in Gaza looks like and about the blockade that my people live under for 16 years. I wanted to meet new people. I wanted to share my story. I wanted to teach them about my people, my family, and myself. Most of the people around the world think that Gazans are terrorists or they have no idea about how, how does it feel to live inside this cage for a long time, about the hardships we go through. I wanted to show them that my people are kind, innovative, and most of all, are hardworking. I wanted to talk about how we don't have access to medicine, investments, education, how we don't have access to most of the basic human rights that most of us here in this room have. I leave Gaza, but leaving is not easy. After I graduated from secondary school, I received and subsequently lost over 10 academic scholarships just because I was not permitted to leave. I even got into a graduate school in Austria. I prepared all the paper. My plane tickets were booked. My accommodation was ready. And I was one step away from just being there and I was blocked from leaving, so I lost it. But I left for the first time when I won the Japan Gas Innovation Challenge. I received a capital for my BRICS company and coaching from Japanese coaches. But to get me outside of Gaza, the Japanese government got the United Nations involved to get me the four permits and coordinations that I need to leave, which is one from Israel, one, a coordination from the Palestinian Authority, a permit from Hamas, and an objection from, Orden, from Jordan. And it's impossible to get the four permits together at one time. I was one of the luckiest Palestinians from Gaza, the less than 2% who managed to leave that year. It was a miracle, it was a real miracle. At this point, I have tried over 20 times to leave. This time, I finally got outside of Gaza. <laughs> it was my first trip outside of this small or this big cage. I was 22. It was my first time on an airplane. I was very, very excited to see an airplane, the crew of the airplane. I took thousands of photos. <laughs> and I saw people who don't speak Arabic, non-Muslims non-Arabic speakers. I cannot explain how magical this experience was for me. This opportunity opened the floodgates for me. 
my work began to be recognized internationally. I was featured over PBC, NBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, and so many other international media outlets. People around the world started to recognize my, word, my work and started to, to ask me how can we be part of it. I was also honored to receive several prestigious awards, including the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award for Confidence, the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award for Confidence, MIT Ban Arab Competition Award, and the Emirates Energy Award. I was able to learn so much about myself, my people, and my country. So, on my third trip outside of Gaza, I went to Europe. They told me that countries, the European countries, when you cross the borders, you don't feel it. I didn't believe it. So I was in Italy, and I rented a car from Venice. So I went to the desk, to the renting agency, and she took my driving license, and she said, we cannot find your country within the listed countries, which is not a surprise for me. And they said, well, we can list you as an Egyptian, Israeli, Jordanian, and I was laughing. And if you know something about the conflict, you will get the irony. I got the car and I started my journey, which took me two hours and a half. I was driving and as, as I was approaching the borders, I was looking, I was waiting to see something, a fence, a soldier, a military, guns, something I'm used to see. I saw nothing. All what I saw on my phone from Google Maps, welcome to Slovenia. <laughs> so just imagine what does that felt for me. Every time I've left Gaza, I knew that I, might I, may, I may never be able to leave again. I also knew that I will face interrogations from Israel and Hamas, and I will be kept in hours and hours inside a room with no water or food, just and getting questions that has nothing to do with me and my, my work. <sighs> Israel continues to restrict the freedom and undermine the equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel, as well as those in the West Bank and Gaza. In the West Bank, there are more than 800,000 settlers who are illegally stealing the land. And despite the international law, they keep doing this. At the same time, we see until today home demolition to uproot the Palestinian communities. But this is not the only issue. Palestinians also are not only suffering inside Palestine, it's beyond that, as you can see in the screen. Me, myself, I have a very limited access to most of the countries around the world. I'm not welcomed on most of the Arab and Western countries, and that was the hard reality that until today, I cannot accept. And for simple reasons, those countries are satisfying the ones who have resources, and we don't have resources for obvious reasons. More than five million Palestinians across the Arab countries are stateless. They are holding a refugee document that's issued either by Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, or a travel document from Israel, or a Palestinian travel document from the Palestinian Authority, and the lucky ones that we consider is the, are the ones who hold the Israeli travel document. Eight identities for the Palestinians, while for the Israelis there is only one identity, which is an Israeli passport. Palestinians are the largest stateless community in the world. That's a fact. The majority of those Palestinians lack basics to human rights and live under daily occupation. So occupation is not only inside, the, inside Palestine, it's, even be, it's beyond those borders. For example, my husband who's sitting with you today, he holds an Egyptian travel document that in, in, on the first page of this document says you cannot even enter Egypt. So he has no place to go. He cannot even return to Gaza Strip if he wants to. And because the right to nationality is a fundamental human rights, when I became pregnant, I decided to give birth in the United States because I didn't want my daughter to go through what I've been through. So let's take a moment of silence and think, how does it feel to live insecure, threatened, and also treated unequally everywhere you go. It's hard to imagine, right? This is my daily life. 
For me, this annual convention represents a site of possibility. On the other hand, if the, if, if the narrative does not shift, it remains an echo chamber where similar-minded individuals have conversation in isolation that do not push us towards progress. There are three main misconceptions that I feel I should mention here in this stage. The first one, the biggest misconception that this has been going forever. Those people have always been fighting. That's not true. The second one, that this is a religious battle. I believe this is not a religious battle. It's a battle over land. My generation recognizes the intersexualities of movements and the horizontal continuities between the struggle of a freedom globally. My generation sees alternatives, and there are more ways to do something. My generation values solidarity. We got an ice cream company to say no to the settlements, so we have to get more. There will never be secure democratic Israel without a free Palestine state. My generation does not put faith in politicians. They put their faith in people. We no longer believe in the political futures our leaders are drawing for us. As Israel is depending on Abbas for peace, we Palestinians are always left behind in the international accords. My, ge my generation recognizes that if they don't do it by themselves, no one else will do it. And I hope the next generation of J Street organizers will not just only offer solidarity in words, but commit more actions to political and economical actions to support Palestinian free, pa free Palestine, free state for Palestinians. I was not able to make some boxes a success unless I got sufficient help from US investors, coaches, and mentors. So I'm asking and I'm hoping J Street will empower more US companies to invest in the Palestinian startups and to work with you with, with Palestinian companies. As we stand here today at this annual conference, we have an opportunity not just to offer solidarity in words, but also to commit political action grassroots action, local action, economical action, and international action that will give what justice requires, which is a free Palestine. <laughs> Today is an opportunity, not just only for myself, but also for everyone in this room to speak up for the things that are not easy to speak about anywhere else. It's so hard for me to speak up this way in any other stage in the world. No democracy without an independent state, and it will never be. I myself started with a brick and a solar panel. Now it's your turn. <laughs> I will end up with this, uh, with something. I, was, I thought for, for a long time what, what should be an ending. And I thought as, as a speaker of the J Street Annual Conference, on behalf of the two million Gazans who live under the blockade in Gaza and the 10 million Palestinians who live outside of Gaza, I will dedicate my life to empower social entrepreneurs to change how the world perceives us. And I will not be afraid. I will learn to embrace uncertainty. And when the world pushes me to my knees, I will pray. I will pray that God gives me the witness to see a free Palestine one day. Thank you. Wow. What a leader and what an entrepreneur.
amazing. It is clear to me that the only way to change the reality on the ground is if we all work together. And we need the support and involvement of Americans like you to do so. There is a great international and local focus about how we can build upon and enhance the Abraham Accords, an excellent example of Jewish-Arab partnership on a regional level. But there is less attention paid to the necessity to invest in enhanced local Israeli-Palestinian and Arab-Jewish cooperation. Despite the polarization in Israeli society, there are opportunities to work together. There are politicians and movements that understand that the only way forward is through working together, Jews and Arabs. One of these leaders is our friend, member of Knesset, Ayman Ode, the leader of the Hadash Tal party. We are also privileged to be joined by Sally Abed and Uri Weltman from the largest grassroots Jewish Arab movement in Israel, standing together. <laughs> standing together is fighting for Israeli democracy, for an end to occupation, and peace and justice for all. But first, I'm pleased to invite MK Ayman Ode to the stage. Good afternoon, J Street. I am honored to be here with you once again. We are, all of us, living through history. This is a dangerous and a challenging time. Benjamin Netanyahu is back in the Prime Minister's office, supported by a supremacist government that has handed over control of its police and border patrol to its most violent extremes. I am worried for the safety of Arab Palestinian communities, for those who speak out against occupation and apartheid, for all minorities, for my own children. It is difficult to overstate just how dangerous this moment is. It is not despite these challenges, but because of them that I have not given up. <laughs> Far from it. And I hope you will join me in my belief that times of a great risk are also times of a great opportunity to create the world we need and the future our children deserve. A few years ago, I picked up the waking edition of Haaretz newspaper and read an article by the late Professor Ze'ev Sternhel of blessed memory, Zechrono Labracha, a child survivor of the Holocaust and Israel's leading expert on fascism. He wrote that in all Europe, the pre-fascism and the pre-Nazi nationalists were united their hatred of human rights, pluralism, and democratic government. It was 2019, and the right-wing government in Israel had just passed the nation state law, which defined the state as one for Jews only. Professor Sternhel wrote that this reminded him of the early stages of Nazism. Antisemitism was not an accident that happened to European history, he wrote, nor did fascism and Nazism suddenly land from outer space. I was so shaken by the gravity of his warning that I went to visit Professor Sternhel in his home that evening. I talked 
about the extraordinary success of Arab Palestinian students in universities. I talked about the Arab Palestinian doctors who made up almost half of newly qualified physicians in Israel that year, even though we represent only one fifth of the population. Professor Sternhill listened quietly as I boasted of our community's shining achievements. Then, without a word, he led me into his library and opened a book titled The Jewish Population in Germany, 1930. I could feel my heart beat race as he began reading to me about the German Jewish community's shining achievements, the hospital directors, the heads of banks, the university presidents. He looked at me and said something I will never forget, and which has haunted me over these last weeks and months. Make no mistake, he said, without democracy, it is not the failure, but rather the success of a minority that may trigger a deadly turn of events. Let me be perfectly clear. I am not comparing current events to the crimes of the Nazis. There is no comparison. Still, this is also clear. Occupation is not an accident that happened to our history, nor did Itamar ben Gvir and his violent supremacist movement land from outer space. And I fear we have already begun seeing another deadly turn of events. I have dedicated my life to representing Palestinian citizens of Israel including in the Knesset, because I know that while we cannot end the occupation and bring peace alone, it's clear that political change is, is impossible without us. Despite living with structural discrimination, we have consistently rallied the power of our community to support genuine democracy one based on equality and safety, not only for ourselves, but for all people. <laughs> These elections were no different. Netanyahu and his allies did their best to suppress the votes of Arab Palestinian citizens through intimidation, surveillance, and lies. They borrowed tactics from white nationalists who continue their attempts to suppress the votes of black Americans, but we made our voices heard. We are not subjects. We are citizens. And we have brought our full strength, joined together with the Jewish people who share our commitment to genuine democracy, to end the occupation and achieve a future of social justice and peace. <laughs> this is our goal. And I have always been willing to work together with other parties to advance it. But I refuse to be drafted to defend the political center's idea of democracy, one which tells us that our most basic needs, the struggle for equality and for an interoccupation, must be set aside for another day. This I cannot accept. Democracy means an interoccupation. 
Democracy means a Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state on the basis of the 1967 borders with full national and civic equality for all people who live between the river and the sea. There is no democracy without us. We are doing our part. It is time for the global community and our Jewish colleagues in Israel to do their part. When, politician, when politicians discuss democracy in Israel, they seem satisfied with our George Orwell reality in which some are more equal than others. Netanyahu's only vision for the future of this place is one built on the supremacy of Jewish Israelis and the inequality of Palestinians. Wherever we live, that is why Netanyahu has empowered Jewish supremacists like Ben Gvir, passed laws that make Palestinian citizens of Israel second class and chosen to deepen occupation into apartheid. Netanyahu's vision is war and occupation forever. This vision includes the families killed by Israeli missile strikes, paid for by American taxpayer dollars, and the disposition of Arab Palestinian families in Bedouin communities. When politicians, including Biden administration, provide a blank check to the Israeli military, they materially support this vision. <laughs> when they discuss Israel's security, I don't believe that my children's, my children's safety is considered part of the equation. It is time they have the bravery to implement policies that demand democracy, equality, and peace. I am proud to lead a political movement that has at its heart a partnership between Arab Palestinians and the Jews to achieve those goals. Because no matter the holidays we celebrate or the language of our lullabies. We all deserve to live a good life, to put food on the table, to come home safely at the end of the day, to know our children will too. It shouldn't be surprising that a Jewish only left is doomed to fail. But this moment, holds great opportunity. Political power built on Arab, Palestinian, and Jewish partnership can, lo no, lo can no longer be marginalized or ignored. We have proven that it is the key of our success. It is the partnership that has led us to become the largest progressive bloc in the Knesset. It is the partnership that is the cure for the supremacy. And it is the partnership that will change the face of our politics and the course of our fates. <laughs> Over the last several years, I have seen the world change as the black Americans asserted their fundamental humanity. Black lives matter. America is still far from racial equality and justice, but no one can deny that a powerful transformation is in the process. A real solution for all Palestinians and all Israelis requires a sea change on the same scale. And if we have learned anything over the past several years, it is that powerful transformation is possible, even for things we have taken for granted. 
every day for the last 55 years. The Israeli government has made a decision to continue the occupation. There is no another choice, one that could be made today or tomorrow to end the occupation instead. Like black Americans, Arab Palestinians, whether we live in Israel or in the occupied West Bank, Gaza, or East Jerusalem, are demanding nothing less than for our lives to be valued and protected the outcome of policy that fully honors our humanity as Palestinians will be a society in which equality, justice, and freedom are for all of us across nationality, religion, and citizenship for Arabs and Jews, Palestinians and Israelis alike to outcome will, we will be a shared future. Our progressive friends around the world have an important role to play, but nothing will change if the global community continues doing the same things it always has. We can take the opportunity of this moment only if we decide to, spe to speak with one voice to say that the only future is a shared future. We can take this opportunity only by refusing to legitimize any politician whose solution is supremacy. We have the opportunity now, today, to heed Professor Sternhell's warning. All that is required is that the majority uses its power and the privilege to join together with the minority, rather than point the finger at us. In partnership, we can avoid another deadly turn of events. We can do more than that. We can free ourselves, all of us, together. My friends, let your heart break. Let it break open. Let it inspire you to ask, what am I willing to do now for the shared future Palestinians and Israelis deserve? Let it inspire you to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please welcome the national leadership of Standing Together, Sally Abed and Uri Weltman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Wow. <laughs> we are so grateful and honored to be here with you. Thank you for having us. My name is Sally Abed. I am a member of the national leadership at Standing Together. I'm 31 years old. I was raised and born in the village of Mali in Western Galilee, and I currently live with my amazing partner in Haifa. And my name is Uli Weltman. I'm also a member of the National Leadership of Standing Together, a national field organizer for the movement. I live in Tel Aviv with my husband and our two small daughters, age six and eight. Before I start, I really want us to take a minute to just acknowledge this amazing moment. It is very rare for us to experience this kind of space where so many people are gathered not only to envision a better future for us in Israel-Palestine, but actually think collectively of ways to get there. So thank you. Standing Together is the largest grassroots Jewish Arab movement in Israel. We bring people together around the new vision for Israeli society, one that is grounded in the principle of peace, equality, social and climate justice. 
And how do we do it? We do it by organizing people, by setting up local groups throughout the country, in Jewish cities, in Arab cities, and in shared cities, as well as in university and college campuses, and by mobilizing people for change, both through reactive actions as well as in proactive campaigns. This is an emergency rally that we had against the so-called deal of the century, a deal in which Donald Trump and Bibi Netanyahu concluded the annexation of the Palestinian West Bank and stripping hundreds of thousands of Palestinians within Israel from their citizenship. For me, as a Palestinian citizen of Israel, I know very well the meaning of conditional democracy. Because at any given point, my democratic rights and my citizenship can be under threat. And even without this threat, Palestinian citizens of Israel suffer daily discrimination and oppressive policies, especially so after the passing of the so-called nation-state law four years ago, which cemented Sally's status as a Class B citizen. Now, following the recent elections, this threat is more tangible than ever. Openly Kahanist groups, for the first time in Israel's history, will enter government. They will be given executive power to pursue freely their dangerous agenda. It's dangerous for us Palestinians within Israel. It's going to be dangerous for Palestinians in the occupied territories. But it's also going to be dangerous for many of the already marginalized groups within Israeli society. This, inclu this includes women, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ community, including Uri's family. Facing this danger, we need to build a people's opposition to bring together the various communities affected by the discrimination in our society, by the oppression in our society, by the injustices in our society. And we will do this by telling a new political story. And this political story, you know, like any story, requires a protagonist. Who is us? That is, after all, the main question in politics, right? Who is us and who is they? Is it us, the Palestinians, and them, the Jewish people? Is it us, the moral, the enlightened, the liberal, and them, the ignorant, the racist, the basket of deplorables? <laughs> is it us, the seculars in the state of Tel Aviv, and them, the religious ones in the small towns in the peripheries. When we speak of us, we envision a very broad us, one that is comprised of both Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel. Jewish-Palestinian joint struggle is not merely Jewish solidarity towards Palestinian, nor is it limited to saying Jews and Arabs refuse to be enemies. Rather, Jewish-Palestinian joint struggle is the very deep notion that we share interests in our society. And therefore, we need to bring about joint struggles around these shared interests. We, Jewish and Palestinians in Israel, we have joint interests to have food on the table, to make ends meet, to live in a affordable house, to walk safely in the street, to have decent public transportation. And yes, Jews and Palestinians in Israel both have an interest in freedom, in peace, in security, and in ending the occupation. This is a story that is seldom told in Israeli politics. A very wide us and a very narrow them. If done methodologically and strategically, it has the potential to actually build the power to enact the change we all want to see. In fact, this is how we believe we can build the foundations for Israeli politics and Israeli society to build the political will, the political capital, to not only fight oppression and inequality, but actually resist the occupation, paving a way for Israeli-Palestinian peace. But it is not always easy to imagine this broader us. We need to train the muscle of political imagination. We need to regain our ability to imagine an Israeli-Palestinian peace and to envision a society that is just and equal, especially at polarizing moments 
like we had during the month of May last year. This photo was taken during a big rally we initiated at the time, organized jointly with other partners against the war, against the violence, against the occupation. Speaking to a crowd of thousands at the, at the march, Sally was reminding the audience that we in Israel, Jews and Palestinians, we all deserve dignity. We all wish to live in security. We all aspire for freedom. This is how we tell a story of us around shared interests, even at times of conflict. We don't pretend like we know exactly how like this new us will look like. We really don't. But we create organized safe spaces for people to be courageous enough to navigate those complexities and acknowledge the difficulties and the obstacles in this kind of story, but also insisting on staying together. We also don't pretend like it's easy. Last May, not last May, the May of last year was really, really hard on all of us, on all of Israeli society and Palestinians. But it was especially hard for Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel who remained together. In the current story of us and they commonly accepted in Israeli politics, we, Palestinians, were not allowed to ache and to feel pain as Palestinians. But we were also not expected to be scared like the average Israeli, even though our streets were on fire and we spilled all nighters in shelters. My Jewish partners were faced with hostility, even though all that they were doing was fight for the security of their families. It was really hard to talk about the new us during May. But standing together was able to create a space for tens of thousands of Israelis, Palestinians and Jewish, to be able to talk about that new us. We are not only reacting to polarizing moments of crisis that are forced on us by the actions of others. We also take initiative into our own hands and launch campaigns that tell this story of a broad us and narrow them and a new majority in Israeli society. We did that a year ago when we launched a campaign to raise the minimum wage in Israel to 40 shekels an hour. This was a campaign that united people across differences. After all, there are both Jewish workers and Palestinian workers in Israel that need a minimum wage raise. There are minimum wage earners in the secular center of Tel Aviv and in the ultra-Orthodox city of Bnei Brak and in the rural towns in the northern and southern peripheries. This campaign has a clear Jewish-Arab us and a clear depiction of the new majority we need in Israeli society. This campaign also gave us an opportunity to create unlikely alliances. After mobilizing hundreds of volunteers to canvas for minimum 40 all throughout Israel and raise the demand in social media and traditional media, we introduced the minimum 40 to the Knesset. We drafted a bill co-sponsored by over 40 members of Knesset from the coalition and from the opposition, Arab and Jewish, secular and religious. As you can see, these are some of the members of Knesset that co-sponsored our bill. And despite the government's opposition to the bill, we were able to pass it in preliminary vote. What enabled us as a movement to do this was not only the fact that we were telling a new political story, but that we organized people and built power that backed this story. If we want to win, if we want to make gains and breakthroughs, if we want to reshape what people think is politically possible in Israel, we need to organize people, we need a grassroots movement in Israel. A movement that is facing the public, that is looking outwards, not to be content merely with speaking with people who are already convinced, but engaging people where they are, in their neighborhoods, in their schools, where they shop. And we consciously devote time 
and resources to build a movement that can do exactly that. To form local chapters in various communities, to train activists in community organizing, to empower students on campuses and politicize these amazing, important shared spaces. And we also develop new emergent leaders, locally and nationally. We also understand that there are no shortcuts. In order to enact change, we need to build power. And in order to build power, we need to organize people within a movement. It is sometimes very easy to despair. As we were making the way here to DC for this conference, we heard the sad news of killing of more Palestinians in the last couple of days. There have been more than 200 Palestinians dead in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem in the last year, making it one of the deadliest years of the past decade. We also saw the return of mass shootings to the heart of Tel Aviv and bus bombings in West Jerusalem. With the nude and dangerous government, we will face ever more threats ever more violence, and ever more challenges. But we also know that it can be different. Because we deserve better. And standing here in front of all of you, and being part of standing together, of Umdim Biyachad, Naqif Ma'an, we believe in our collective ability to change. And what is our belief in our ability to change, if not hope? And in the words of Mahmoud Darwish, the national Palestinian poet, whose words are hung on the entrance of our offices to remind us of this powerful message. Huna, عندما حضرات التلال أمام الغروب وفوهة الوقت قرب بساتين مقطوعة الظل نفعل ما يفعل السجناء وما يفعل العاطلون عن العمل نرب الأمل here, on the slopes of hills, before dusk and the chasm of time, close to the gardens of broken shadows, we do what prisoners do, and what the jobless do. We cultivate hope. We are building a people's movement in Israel. And we know this cause has many allies abroad, including the numerous people here. We are grateful for this opportunity, for J Street to make it happen, and we thank you for your time and support. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, shukran, toda, Ayman, Sally, Uri, for your inspiration. I have to admit that I have been struggling recently as I follow the news cycle in Israel. It's painful to see so much violence, intolerance, and extremism. But being here with all of you and hearing from our speakers today has filled me with a renewed feeling of hope and optimism. I'm grateful to all of our speakers for their tireless work fighting for democracy in Israel and Palestine. Only through the pursuit of democracy and justice can all Israelis and Palestinians live in peace and security. I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of today and tomorrow's excellent conference programming. On behalf of all of us in J Street, we thank you for being here with us today and for being an integral part of our pro-Israel, pro-peace, pro-democracy movement. And before I let you go, I have few announcements. Please bear with me. Um, for those attending Advocacy Day, please pick up your advocacy materials at the advocacy desk next to the registration before tomorrow morning. The second day announcement, earlier today we mentioned the stakes of the upcoming elections in Georgia. We are proud to be holding a Get Out the Vote phone bank today at 7.30 p.m. in the Blue Room and tomorrow at 5 p.m in the same room. We encourage all of you to attend. Thank you very much. Good night. This afternoon's breakout sessions will begin. Conference staff are positioned throughout the hotel 
to assist you in finding your sessions and answering any questions. Enjoy the conference. Yeah.